and the Middle East and its impact after 9-11. And now it seems that the topic is moved to Palestine. Anyway, I'm not going to wear the hat of a diplomat tonight, but I will wear the hat of, a, of an academic who has been teaching American foreign policy and who happens to be born in Jerusalem. I'm by ethnic origin Armenian, but I'm Palestinian by birth, and I am Catholic by denomination, Christian by religion, but also Islamic by culture, and Arab by nationalism. <laughs> I think we have to have a different approach to this debate. It is so classical and so traditional just to talk about the United States and its impact on the Middle East without factoring the elements of internal changes within our political structures in the Middle East and to what extent this impact of westernization process that has been taking place for almost 300 years since the invasion of Napoleon to Egypt in 1798 and the impact of the idea of secularism and how it has affected the notions of Islam and their approach basically to westernization, to secularism and what have you. This is the right approach to understand the mechanisms of change in the Arab world today. And why do we have an uh, Arab Spring, which I hate to use Arab Spring. This is a notion that came from the West. I think we have to say Arab awakening, shifting from secularism back to what we call fundamental Islamic religion. We don't have many changes to talk about, ladies and gentlemen. When we talk about foreign policy of the United States in the Middle East, it has always been constant and the same. And if you go back to the Truman administration back in 1946, up till now, U.S. foreign policy has been based on four cornerstones. One, to contain communism in the Middle East. Now, of course, by the crumbling of, the, of communism, they created a new enemy, and that is Islamic fundamentalism in order to preserve their interests in the Middle East and to justify their hegemonic imperialism in the area. That's number one. Number two, in order to control and try to be, you know, much more in control of such dramatic changes, they have, of course, to have a patriarchal client relationship with something called the State of Israel, which has unequivocal support to it since its creation up till now. The third, basically, is always to secure their oil interests in the Middle East. Let's not kid each other about the idea of invading Iraq because of September 11th or Qaeda or whatever. No. The question is oil. The control of the Caspian Sea, the control of the emergence of Russia and China as big economic power. This is why the Americans wanted the Middle East, which is considered to be a geostrategic interest for their own interests. And number four is to try to curb any kind of radical movements in the Arab world and support Arab proxy regimes that proved nothing except being futile for the last five decades. They did not achieve Arab unity, neither pan-Arabism, nor they have liberated Palestine. So what we have witnessed is constant corruption, one-party rule which ended up in dictatorship, and it was, as I say, we're stuck between the historically inevitable and the politically impossible in the Arab world. It was not by sheer choice that we, the Arabs and the youth, have come forward to change those corrupt regimes. It was a historic inevitability that it had to happen because there is no way we could have sustained the status quo for another decade or so. And this is a new era, a new era for the emergence of Western democracy. And we don't talk about democracy and the emulation of democracy and rule of law and human rights and what have you because we have all these principles and here I'm talking as a Christian. All these principles are found in, the, in, in Islam, in the Quran, the Sunnah, and the Hadith. There is nothing new that you are borrowing from the West. We have to understand that democracy and steel, the Western style, cannot really fly in the Middle East. We have to understand this reality. We have to understand that democracy is shirocracy in the Middle East. We have to understand the question of human rights has been there, you know, indoctrinated in our principles of culture and religion. So there is nothing new that we are borrowing from the West, except the issues of secularism, separation of church from state, except the issues of democracy, rule, minority, right, and those are in total contradiction of the Islamic principles. How could the West try to inculcate such ideology 
in a world that has been politically, culturally, religiously Islamic all the way. So I see there is a big challenge here. And that challenge is not just going to go idle. Because what we see today is the reemergence of fundamentalism, but with a new practical approach of pragmatism, which is choosing between constraints. It's no more the Abdurrahman Kawakibi, Afghani, Abdo, Rashid Rida, and what have you. Those pioneers, Tahtawi, who talked about you know, the Enlightenment period of the, of the French Revolution, of Condorcet, Mirabeau, and what have you, Rousseau, and all these ideas that came basically as a sudden great change in the political discourse of the Arab world that has been under the Ottoman rule that abused Islam as a facade to maintain their own you know, hegemony. That was fine then, but today the challenges are completely different. So Islam that adjusts its way and accommodates its way to time and span should not be really faced away. Because it is a mere challenge of how today Muslim thinkers and ulama are perceiving the West and what to choose from the West and not what to choose from the West. This is what I call the new enlightenment period that came after so many defeats of the Arabs by Israel and what have you. And if we try to look at the emergence of the American being a unipolar power, and after Sir 1988, when the crumbling of the Soviet Union took place, what have we seen for the last 24 years? We have seen the emergence of a police state. Go back and look at every single resolution that came from Security Council or from the General Assembly in supporting Palestine. All of them support Palestine. All of them support the Arab. But show me one time. One of these resolutions have been implemented. Why? Because it is against the interests of Israel. And because there is a Catholic marriage, no divorce between the United States' interests and that of Israel, it will never happen. However, any resolution that comes against Afghanistan, against uh, Iraq, against uh, Egypt, or what have you, it is immediately implemented with sanctions and what have you. So this is the, the, the paradigm of ambivalence, the paradigm of hypocrisy. And then to be preached about democracy, rule of law, and what have you, when I see one of the biggest bigotries in the world is the United States. Go and live there and see the racism. And they are teaching us about rule of law and human rights and tolerance and what have you. I'm trying to be critical, ladies and gentlemen, because I live in both worlds. I happen to teach there and I happen to, to be in the Middle East and I happen to be a Christian looking at Islam from a different perspective than even my fellow Muslim who are ideologue, demagogue. They don't look at Islam as being a religion of tolerance and a religion that could accommodate to the socio-economic, political, objective conditions in the world. They think that this is the way it is during the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Until now, nothing should change. Where is the element of ishtihad here? Why do we close the door of ishtihad? Yes, consensus is okay to a certain degree when there is harmony between those who are in power and those who are accepting that power. And that power should more or less reconcile the legitimacy of the authority. And if you have a deep conviction in the legitimacy of the authority, then I don't see any sense of alienation between those who are governing and those who are governed. This is true democracy. And this is the way we have to treat the democracy of the West as a neighborhood democracy. And talking about 9-11, I think it's positive. It's, it's no more. I mean, they can no more milk the cow. The <laughs> war against terrorism and this and that has proved to be futile. And let me tell you, the Americans, World War I, World War II, okay? Vietnam War, they did not lose as much as they have lost in Iraq. They have invested three trillion dollars. Do you think the Americans are going to leave the oil wells <coughs> in Iraq or in the Gulf? Just like that, after investing three trillion dollars. So what's the idea behind this? Is it really the dissemination of democracy and, and, and rule of law? After all, what is politics if it's not interest, national interest? And how do we define foreign policy? We define it through the domestic determinants 
The nexus between the most domestic determinants and that of foreign policy, it's all tied to national interest and to national strategy. And this is how we look at politics. There is no ethics in politics, sir. There is always economics and self-interest. This is the whole issue about you know, politics in the world. Let's not kid each other that we are now the propagators of human rights and what have you. While I see human rights abuse in the United States much more than any part of the Arab world. When I see almost 12 million people bums sleeping in the streets of New York, in Philadelphia and what have you, and they talk about, you know, uh, social justice and equitable distribution of wealth and what have you. I mean, this is hypocrisy. Let's not kid each ourselves. And I don't want to talk about Palestine and what is happening to Palestine, because I'm invited here tonight as a scholar to talk about the United States and the Middle East in general. Because, you know, as a diplomat, I cannot really interfere in the internal affairs of, of my Arab, you know, countrymen. For the simple fact that if I want to do that, I would be more harsh in criticizing what is happening even today after those dramatic changes that we are witnessing. And I don't see revolution, and excuse me for all those intellectuals who say that we are witnessing revolutions in the Middle East. A revolution, sir, is a social revolution. It's not a, a change of regime. And, and, and going back to ancien regimes with, uh, with, ideologies, with ideologies that has been so obsolete, it's not a revolution. And I think, you know, we have to witness what is going to happen in the Middle East, which I call the Middle East because it is unpredictable for so many reasons. And in the final analysis, I cannot but say that if we don't have back the international system based on multipolar system, I think we have going to witness more ethnic strifes, more conflicts, not only in the region of the Middle East, but all over the world. And today, the credit crunch and the decline in the economic structures today is a good indication that the world should come at one and try to solve the issues, not a la steel, we say in French, of American and Pax Americana, but it has to be done with the inclusion of all those people who have been deprived of political participation of being part of a democratic world the way we would like to see. Thank you very much.